I sit on the Smart Oxford board um, in Oxford, but I actually work for Oxfordshire County Council. Um, I'm the manager of the innovation and research team. Um, our job was originally looking at innovation in transport and looking for funding bids for new technologies in the transport system because we're the highway authority. Um, but it soon became clear that you couldn't look at transport in isolation and there was so many crossovers in terms of smart cities and the Horizon 2020 bids and innovates and innovate bids that, that were coming up. So why Oxford? Why is Oxford a great example um, for testing smart city and smart city solutions? Most of you know about Oxford in terms of the heritage and the intellectual leader, but it's actually quite a compact city when you're comparing it to, say, London and the population of London. Oxford's population is just over 150,000. Um, Oxfordshire um, goes up to, say, 700,000, but still, um, it's a manageable amount. Um, it's a diverse city, lots of cultures. It's also got high inequalities. Um, we, if you live in North Oxford, um, you're likely to live 10 more years than if you live a mile away in East Oxford. So huge inequalities. In terms of congestion, um, because of the nature of the, the city, you can't build your way out of the, the transport problems that we have in the city. Um, we've got the green belt, the, the floodplain, and all the conservation. So we've got severe congestion and challenges in Oxford. And so therefore, that leads to many environmental issues. So what's exciting here in terms of local authority roles? So what I want to talk about today is why is Oxfordshire um, investing time and effort and money in I don't know why that's jumping in smart cities when frontline services are being reduced. Um, my team has gone from two, three years ago to ten members of staff um, three years later. So the reason that we're doing that is we sit in a really unique space. Cities are dynamic spaces and um, to thrive they need to meet the economic and social aspirations of the people that live there. And in Oxford, those aspirations are pretty high. Um, smart cities don't just happen. City needs help um, at developing the capability for that collaboration um, between the citizens, between the universities, and between the businesses. Um, it's our view that a council has a really important role to play there. And I've been working for the past two to three years to try and create that collaboration between partners we are a neutral space. Um, we have a lot of challenges. We're a problem owner. Um, although we, as I say, we're revenue poor, we are asset rich. So we own the roads. We have got the infrastructure, the, the street lighting, the parking. We've got lots of spaces that people can test their technology. So in Oxford, what I've been driving for the past two to three years is creating Oxford as the living laboratory of the southeast. So come to Oxford, it's a manageable size and you can test your new technologies. And I think what's really important is we're there to say, look, we've got the challenges. Um, don't just come with the technology, understand what our challenges and our problems are first. So I work closely across a number of services, um, not just transport, for adult and social care. So I'm constantly talking to the, the social carers that have got the problems in terms of the challenges of assessing the people with needs and how technology could help this. Many of these service areas didn't know about the opportunities and funding that they could get from Innovate UK. So I come to them and say, I'm part of a 1 million bid for digital wearable devices. Do you want to be involved? Of course they do, but they just haven't got the time or the whereabouts to actually understand um, what's out there. So as um, I think Tim was saying, it's the bridging the gap between people who work in these areas and these departments, but actually don't know and don't use the, the, you know, the digital technology that's out there. So as I say, we are selling ourselves as a living laboratory. We want people to come to us as a neutral space and to understand the challenges that we are experiencing in our fire service, in our adult and social care, or on the transport network. We've got a huge amount of data. Um, and we're in the process of re reviewing that and cleansing that. 
but we're willing to share that with parties and to say, look, if you want to test your technology, look at the data and look at the challenges. We then will allow trials. We've got a really exciting project in the south of the county where um, it's a science park called Cullum, Cullum Science Park. And it is a closed fence site, 2,000 employers, 10 hectares site, 10 kilometers of road, and we've got agreement with them. The innovators and technology providers can test their products on a, a mini real environment before they actually test it on the roads or the environment in Oxford. So we're looking to trial. But for me, the most important thing is the implementation. I don't want to be a city that just has about 20, 20 trials but nothing goes to market. It's about creating growth and money for the UK and for Oxfordshire. So it's actually about looking at adoption pathways, how are we going to adopt these technologies. And I think if you keep coming back and keep coming back on the feedback loop and looking at the challenges and testing the results, you're more likely to do that if we work with partners effectively. So what does success look like for me? How do I convince my chief exec um, that it's worthwhile to continue investing in our area? Um, well, half of our team are now self-funding, so that's one thing. Um, my, my aim is I think we need to continue. I don't want to spin out from the, from the local authority because I think we're best placed um, as a local authority to stay in there. But I think we can fund ourselves through other bids as well. I think the giving the council the, the tools to think differently and to take risks is really crucial. I think if the local authorities are playing it safe, then they're going to be left behind and they're going to be in a more challenging situation if they don't look at the, the new ways of working. As a team, we've promoted economic development and we've um, encouraged startups to stay in Oxford because we've said, look, here's our data. It's free. We've got a working relationship with you. Stay in Oxford. We've promoted collaboration with universities, with some big businesses, but also SMEs. And having that working relationship has not only upskilled internal staff, it's up upskilled the partners so they're actually understanding what products they're developing and why. Um, as I say, we, we've been gaining funding for, for new schemes. Um, I think we've got over the past year and a half, eight million, um, eight million investment. Um, uh, another um, programme that I've put forward is uh, we set up a community interest company called Mobility Oxford. This was about focusing on mobility challenges in Oxford particularly um, and looking at, again, creating a neutral space where businesses can come into this space and have access to world-class world research from the universities and also our data. And as Peter was saying, there are opportunities for understanding when the next procurement process is coming up, when are we doing our next round of procurement and our street lighting. So it's having access to that data and that knowledge and understanding what our future strategies are looking like. So. I thought it would be useful to just give an insight on a number of the projects that we're working on, um, just a handful, um, to show you how um, we're working in a smarter way and we're pushing the agenda for smart cities forward. Um, the next few slides link very much with the, the morning session. Um, so autonomous vehicles. Now for me, because I've got a background in, in planning and strategic planning, I think this is an absolutely <laughs> fascinating and exciting area of work. Um, we in Oxfordshire are lucky enough to have the developers of the autonomous vehicles, the only autonomous vehicles that have been tested in the UK are being developed um, by the Robotics Institute in Oxford and then by Oxbotica on the Cullum site. And they're the bit, at the moment, they're being tested in Milton Keynes and Greenwich. Um, we've got a project at the moment that's called Driven. Uh, the vision of the, dri the Driven project is about ensuring and ensuring um, and exporting a fleet of all autonomous and connected vehicles. The reason that the County Council want to be involved in this is it's the future. We're the Transport Authority. We want to be at the bleeding edge of any new technology and therefore policy development that our cities are going to experience. So as part of this project, we are um, going to have a huge amount more data um, on what the transport network is looking like. 
I know we've said that some data is too much, but at the moment, yes, we're data heavy and data rich in our city, but we're the most rural county in the southeast. So we haven't got a lot of data for our rural areas. And this project will be looking at buying infrastructure sensors and connecting it to the driverless fleet and will give us a huge amount of data for managing our transport network for the future, um, looking at congestion, looking at air quality uh, and generally looking at those opportunities of understanding what the system uh, in the rural areas is going to look like. Um, the, the partners are, are quite unique. So we've got the, the dedicated autonomy specialists um, and they're world class leading um, in this area. We've obviously had to look at the, the cyber security and the insurance, which I think the insurance is a really, really interesting part of the autonomous vehicle sector and looking at that flexible and variable inf insurance policy and how, you know, what's that going to look like. Um, we've got race and that's the column site that you test the test the vehicles and we've got oxfordshire county council on transport for london now the reason transport for london are on there is because we are looking to promote a route so promoting a route from oxford to london so not just one quite easy um, to manage um, route across the city this is going to be an interurb and interrural route that is going to face many many challenges along that route and we want to be at the heart of helping to solve those challenges um, and see how we can overcome the challenges. As I say, data is something that, as a transport authority, we're hugely interested in. Um, we manage the transport network and, and as part of our urban traffic management control, we have a huge amount of data coming in and going out, which is informing us what is happening in real time on the network. One Transport is an Innovate UK project, which is, again, looking at the challenge of providing a platform to open market where multimodal travel data is published. So this is not for citizens to use necessarily in terms of a, a journey planning app. It's not another transport app. It's for subscribers and um, transport authorities who want to look and app developers who want to analyse the, the data and provide products. I think the reason that this project is really interesting and could be exploited in the future is our transport issues and our smart city issues don't stop at the city boundary. They, they go across local authority areas. So if we've got some form of standardization of the transport data, then when we're looking at the, the problems on the network, we can go further because at the moment we all have our data coded in different ways and um, in different formats. So as I said, we're interested in the, these projects on data and transport data because helping us to understand and reduce congestion, improve travel experience, uh, make the network more efficient. Again, as we've said, the challenges are huge. Standardizing this data is huge. And identified, identifying holes in data coverage when you don't know where the holes are is also very challenging. We are looking at the commercialization of data. As I said at the start, we want our data at the county council to be free and we want people to use it to a point. If they start making a huge amount of money on it, then we need an agreement with them. So it's how we make that commercialization different for different users and, and different um, companies. So Waze. Waze is uh, another project, Waze Connected Communities uh, program. Um, has anyone heard of Waze? Okay, so for those who don't know what Waze is, it's, uh, it's a tr it's travel planning app that is crowdsourced. So you have got the travel planning, the, the app as you're driving, and you inform what the, the community, the Waze community, what is happening real time on your journey as you're moving along. Um, the reason that local authorities or Oxfordshire are interested in this is that it's a new way, again, of sharing transport data to add value to our already existing data set, but it's a two-way data exchange. So Waze uh, are giving us all their real time data for free, um, and we are giving them our urban traffic management control data so their product is more rich because of the relationship and, and so is ours. I think the challenges to this is 
in the US um, and Israel and other areas, Waze is huge. Um, in the UK, although London it's pretty, it's pretty well used, in the rest of the UK it's not necessarily as well used. So that data that we're getting out is not uh, really high quality yet. But it's just shown that we're willing to work in different ways with different partners to gain added value to the data that we already have. Okay, um, so fire service and adult and social care projects. Now, these are the areas that have been most difficult to access in the past for businesses. And I think that's where our team play a really crucial role because I've worked really hard in the past year to gain um, really good relationships with partners here and for them to understand the benefits of being part of the smart city conversation and discussion. And I think, yes, social care, adult social care, it's the big black hole for local authorities. And that's why we haven't gone near it or many areas haven't gone near it. But therefore, there's the most to be made, the most money to be saved uh, and the most added value. So one of the projects that we're working on it, with the fire service is um, an alarm sensor. So at the moment, the, the fire services, the alarms that they fit in vulnerable houses and vulnerable users, they're not connected. So we don't know whether they have switched them off. We don't know how many times they've been used. Uh, we haven't got any data on these alarms. Um, what this project uh, is doing, um, it's using a Law 1 connected sensor. It's connecting the sensors so the data is being fed right back to the fire service. So these sensors will show you um, how many times the fire um, alarm has been set off. Um, whether what the humidity, what the temperature is. So looking at different environmental effects as well. So the reason that this is important is if there is a change of activity in the, in the use of the fire alarm, um, then the, the fire service crew um, will, will visit the place uh, and see why there's a change of use. It might be health, it might be something to do with drug or alcohol abuse, but your you're being proactive in finding the issue and the problem before something severe or some an incident could happen. So that's really in interesting, and it also crosses over with some of our adult and social care projects because you could look start looking at fuel poverty if you've got low temperatures, high humidity. Um, so there's lots of crossovers there, and it's um, I think we've got about 30 sensors at the moment, but we're looking to exploit that, roll that out, and take that um, to other authorities. And the reason that this was interesting is that this started with a project for parking sensors and we thought actually these sensors could be used for something else as well. So the next area that, as I say, is really interesting is the, the digital health um, and the big challenge of embedding digital health in the new care settings and new pathways. Um, how do we do this using big data, using the new technologies um, and looking at the challenges that we've got in social care? Um, well, the discussions that I've had more recently with social care, social care um, is one of the challenges is how do we assess people and assess their needs? Often it's a, an interview, an hour interview at one point of time to judge what service they may need for the next five years. Often these people who are getting the, the services, it's taken them so long to get that in the interview and that assessment that they just want the care, whether or not they need it or not for the next five years or next four years. Um, so a project that I'm working with, with Henley Business School, it's an Innovate project, it's a million pounds, and it's looking at wearable devices that could help with that assessment process. So there might be some people that don't need as much care, they, don't, they might not need to be visited four times a day, it might just be a one day visit, or they may need more help. So it's making that assessment process more accurate and more useful, and that should save huge amounts of money for our areas, because we just haven't got the time to assess people regularly. But if we've got someone wearing a, a device for a week, that we can really look at their activity levels and their heart rate and their blood pressure, then it will be a much more accurate assessment. So that's really exciting and really interesting. Now, this is a totally different project, um, which may seem, it is fun and we want it to be fun, um, 
but it's got the underlying agenda of bringing smart cities um, and the smart city agenda and innovation to the masses and so people feel like they're part of it and I've always said as part of my team innovation does not have to be about technology it can just be about doing things differently and surprising people but helping them to engage better in a service or in a city. So the project that we're working on um, is Smart Oxford Playable City. Um, has anyone heard of Playable Cities? Just one. Okay. Well, Playable City, the aim of Playable City is to combine public spaces open to all with installation, installations commissioned by creative teams. So it's about crossing innovation with arts and with people and with public spaces. So it's a playful way to trigger this conversation of smart cities. So it's not just in these rooms in London, it's actually bringing it to the people. So Playable City is a product already. It's um, been going since 2013, originated by the watershed in Bristol um, and has been commissioned across nine other cities, um, Tokyo, Dublin, Lagos, um, none others in the UK uh, apart from Bristol, and Bristol was the first one. Uh, we were really keen to be part of this because we thought that it's a really interesting approach in terms of bringing arts, innovation and smart cities to the people. So what would it look like for Oxford? Previous um, Previous playable cities have, it's been about a competition. So it's a competition where you apply for, you bid to be the competition winner and it has to be something innovative to do with cities. And then you get judged and then you get a prize, a pot, pot of money um, of say 40 grand to then develop that product and commercialize that product. And because playable city now has got a big brand most of the, the winners have gone across the world selling that and commercialising that and exploiting that. So for Oxford, what would it mean for Oxford? So the competition would start in April um, and we, we would ask for people to create an impactful installation to surprise, engage and inspire um, using smart technology and Internet of Things, um, looking to businesses, visitors uh, and Oxford residents so this is for everyone who uses the space in the city. This is about talking about Smart Oxford in a different way. We want people, we want people across the UK and the world to recognise Smart Oxford um, as a place where different things happen and we challenge things. Um, the only famous person I can think of for this one is Michael Heseltine is on the judging panel. Does that count? It's not quite a Jerry Spice, is it? Not sure if he's flavour of the month at the moment, but you know. <clears throat> he, yeah, I know. Does we'll he sing and dance? I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay. So next steps. Uh, at the moment, um, we are really looking to create. Yes, we've got lots of partnerships and alliance, but we're looking to create some more formal partnerships and alliance to look at innovation and connectivity in Oxford. So how do we plan and deliver infrastructure for the future? Because I don't want to be part of another local authority team that um, writes a strategy document that the infrastructure costs of that strategy document are 35 million. So everything that we're proposing in that document is unlikely to happen. What's the point? Um, so I want to start collaborating with business to say, OK, why don't you help influence, look at the challenges of Oxford and you can be part of the procurement process for helping develop that document and actually being part of solving the problems for Oxfordshire uh, and paying some of the money as well. Um, we will continue to look outwardly for new collaborations. Um, at the moment, we've got 23 live bids uh, in our team, um, two with India, one with Brazil. So we're looking beyond, beyond UK, beyond Europe. Um, and every bid that I look at, I will be looking at adoption pathways. I do not want Oxford and Oxfordshire just to be a smart city trial. I want it to be a place where things start to happen and can be then exploited elsewhere. Um, how are we doing for time? We're out. We're out. Okay, look, I'm done. So brilliant. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Any questions at lunch would be great.
in a minute on the panel. Thank you, Laura. <laughs>